So uh, let's get started. My name is Mary Brocker. I will be serving as your moderator for the day. And I would love to introduce uh, Gerald Homey, who will be running technical assistance for us. He continues to uh, chime in in the chat, uh, talking about how to access captions, uh, which is uh, to click on a link, and you will find that Heather from Caption First a disability-owned business enterprise is real-time captioning for us. So um, we will also be welcoming our presenter, uh, Scott Hammerstrom. More about Scott in a few minutes. So first, I would love to welcome uh, Christy Troutman, heading the FISA Foundation, to kick off our web event. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, my name is Christy Troutman. I am the executive director of FISA Foundation um, and just thrilled to have all of you joining us for today's webinar. FISA's mission is to improve the lives of women and girls and people with disabilities throughout southwestern Pennsylvania. And we are so excited um, to have partnered with the Heinz Endowments in 2019 to start a regional initiative called Disability Inclusion and Access Moving Forward. Um, we know that, um, or our goal really was to help nonprofits realize that people with disabilities are part of our community, and regardless of the mission of your particular organization, are likely part of your clients, your staff, your volunteers, and your donors. And we know that you want to do the best possible job in serving and making your communications and services accessible and welcoming. Um, we know that about 20% of the American population has disabilities, and so making sure to remove barriers is a really important for all nonprofit organizations. But a lot of the leaders that we had spoken to weren't really sure beyond ramps and elevators how to recognize accessibility barriers and what to do about them. And so we were very excited to partner with Bender Consulting Services who bring enormous expertise in the area of accessibility and inclusion um, to partner on a series of webinars. Um, we'll be launching today's webinar in just a moment um, with content, but I wanted to let you know that you can find a whole host of other resources at Disability Inclusion and Access Moving Forward. The URL for that is disabilityinclusionpgh.org. You can find links to videos from our launch event, um, past uh, disability inclusion webinars with Bender Consulting on specific topics, and a host of links of resources for how-to um, information about access and inclusion. So thanks very much, um, and I will turn it back over to Mary. Hey, thanks so much, Christy. We're always uh, enthusiastic about partnering with you and really greatly appreciate your leadership, not just in our community, uh, nationally, and now we have folks globally who are accessing the website for those uh, webinars. Um, so. I'm going to kick, kick this off. We are involved in a two-part series. Uh, Scott Hammerstrom will be presenting, as I mentioned, and this part explores how we can tactically use virtual tools and features to interact in an accessible and meeting, meaningful way. The next uh, session, it talks about uh, using free and low-cost tools, uh, of course, with the world changing. Uh, 28 weeks ago, uh, we don't have uh, the budget for high-cost tools, um, and these tools will help to decrease the distance between the optimal live event and digital participation. So um, we are entitling this event, The New Normal, Evolving Virtual Accessibility. Uh, and, and also, uh, we, we want to uh, welcome all of you and share with you what our run of show is going to be today. So first, we're going to talk about the virtual event life cycle. Next, virtual engagement tools. Uh, and finally, virtual event management, which is, let's just make it happen, 
uh, and not just talk about it. So as for me, I had operations for Bender Consulting Services. I am a person who's living with uh, disability, uh, depression for the, about the last 40 years. Uh, getting back to Bender, our mission is to advance freedom through competitive employment, uh, advance disability inclusion and digital accessibility, which is of course, one of the things that Scott will be talking about today. Our footprint is national with um, uh, Joyce having in, and I have also had an opportunity to work on State Department um, uh, events on disability inclusion in countries like South Korea, Indonesia, uh, and many others. Uh, Joyce Bender, many of you may know her. She is our CEO and president. We, by the way, in the disability community, as you all know, are thrilled to celebrate ADA 30. And at the same time, we are celebrating Bender 25. Uh, just two years ago, uh, Joyce uh, became, she, she's the founder of Bender Leadership Academy. And the goal of Bender Leadership Academy is a, to advance career success and work experience for students with disabilities. Uh, one more thing about Joyce, she's an incredible volunteer. She is currently the chair of the board of the Epilepsy Association of Western Pennsylvania. She serves as the vice chair for the American Association of People with Disabilities. And wait, there's more on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time, Joyce is the host of Disability Matters with Joyce Bender. So let's get started with the introduction of our presenter. I absolutely love this presenter so much. He has been on Team Bender for well over a decade. Uh, he is a uh, project manager for the Bender Leadership Academy and at Bender Consulting Services, he's the product manager for our work place mentoring product, a key to success for folks living with disabilities to be able to not just get a job, but integrate into the environment, uh, love life, and make a contribution to uh, businesses across the U.S. and government agencies. Uh, Scott's in the past worked with Best Buddies and the Arthritis Foundation of Western Pennsylvania. And without further ado, I'd love to pass this on to Scott. You're up, Scott. Well, thank you so much, Mary. I appreciate that. And thank you to the, the FISA Foundation and Heinz Endowments for doing this. And uh, and uh, very excited to be presenting. And so we're breaking this down into three sections. And the first section, as we mentioned, is the virtual event life cycle from registration to post-event uh, communication. Um, so that's where we're going to start off. Um, so as you know, and and you're probably learning since March, um, you're going to be doing a lot more virtual events. And we have uh, many different types of events, from webinars um, to one-on-one -on -one connections to training and workshops, external vi uh, virtual meetings, uh, virtual conferences, um, all different types of virtual events. And uh, the one thing with that is um, these could be small groups. They could be large groups, or they can just be one-on-one -on -one meetings or, or talking to one-on-one. -on -one. So when we mention internal virtual meetings, what does that mean? That could include like staff meetings, if you're interviewing, uh, group meetings or team meetings with, um, with your department, brainstorming uh, sessions, um, introductions to a change in processes for your company, um, or employee development or, or coaching. Um, external, what, what does that mean? So that could be if you're doing a sales pitch, um, presentation to an existing customer, uh, presentation to a donor or a funding source, or, or just connecting with the community. So all different types of uh, virtual events. And I think everybody's, like I said, since, uh, since March, we're all getting used to it and, and doing more of these and becoming a little bit more comfortable, but there's, there's so much to it. Um, so. Mary gave a little bit of background um, with Bender Leadership Academy. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. So two years ago, we started this uh, nonprofit organization called Bender Leadership Academy. And what it is is that changing the career trajectory and increase long-term competitive integrated employment for people with disabilities with competency-building programs that enable students with disabilities to build workplace and leadership competencies. We develop a real work experience 
and we set and achieve career journey goals. And we, we think of this as sort of like a journey. And we want to, you know, start, we start young, we're eighth grade, ninth grade, and, and educate, right? We're educating them, and we're going to empower them, evolve, and then get them employed, and then elevate. That is the goal with uh, Bender Leadership Academy. And we do general work competencies, work-focused competencies, work-based learning, competitive employment, and also down the road, career advancement. It's always the goal. Um, so those, that is what um, the you know, Bender Leadership Academy is. And, and with that, I work on um, multiple programs, multiple projects, but the three of the, the programs that I did want to talk to you about uh, today as we're going through this presentation, um, one of them is called a work readiness program. Uh, this is a program that we already completed. Uh, we did this during the summer and preparing students with disabilities for the world of work. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about my experiences uh, coordinating that event. And also during this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about two events that we are currently um, planning. Um, one of them is called Disability Mentoring Day. Um, and Disability Mentoring Day is uh, where typically we have 600 high school students with disabilities go to a local business, a college or university, um, a government agency. Um, you know, the companies could be small, could be large, and they usually get one-on-one -on -one mentoring, learn a little bit about the business, the world of work, usually speakers. Um, so that is typically what we have done in the past. And this year, we sort of had to change all of a sudden because we realized that in May that some of the, the, the businesses were um, not going back to the office. And we're realizing that some of the schools could be going back to school. Some may not. Some are doing hybrid. Um, and some the students could be just doing online themselves. So we had to determine how do we figure out from going from a um, in-person in, in mentoring event to a virtual event. And, uh, and then the other thing that we do is uh, we do a Disability Mentoring Day reception, which was usually two days prior to Disability Mentoring Day. Usually it's at the Heinz History Center. We have about 150 people in attendance. Uh, we have uh, national speakers. We have students with... Uh, um, student speakers and, and sponsor speakers, and we do um, people who are in attendance could be business leaders, disability leaders, politicians, and we had to figure out, and unfortunately from doing that from an in-person at the Heinz History Center to doing that virtually as well. So those are some of the things that I've been working on and, and, and dealing with uh, as we uh, move forward with uh, some of these events. And then getting back to the, the, the work readiness program, that was a program that we've been doing for eight years in the summer at a location where schools, uh, students would attend, you know, for four hours, a couple days a week and go on for five or six weeks. Um, and then we had to figure out how to make that into a, a virtual setting as well. Um, and the struggles that we came up with, and, uh, and we'll talk to you about that. Um, but basically, we had, um, you know, up, we had to update our curriculum. We had from 80 hours of uh, um, school time or class time, we had to cut that back to like 40 hours. And the time during the day for the class, we had to cut that back because we realized that uh, pretty much uh, two hours at a time on, online for a meeting uh, for students is going to be the maximum that you can do. So we had to make a lot of adjustments on the fly. And our teachers who teach these curriculum, we had to, they had to adjust and, and to adapt because they had to um, um, learn from going from in-person teaching that they've been doing for so many years to teaching through the computer. And we had, a, and they had to learn the te technology as well. We have a, one of our teachers was a retired school teacher. And uh, so we we're teaching them a brand new platform. And what was funny is some of the students in the class were actually helping her with the technology uh, during the first week of the class. So, uh, so it was an inter interesting dynamic and in how uh, that all happened. So, uh, 
Um, so that is a little bit about, you know, some of the programs that we're doing. So, so think about considerations in building an event. So you have your content, your presenters, your audience, your data, your connectivity, and if it's accessible or not. So content. So we talked about the length, you know, you know, usually one hour to two hours is probably going to be the maximum that you're going to get somebody's attention and people are so busy. So you want to make sure you limit the, uh, the time and scope of, of your uh, meeting, presentation, whatever it may be. Um, presenter. Some presenters are, um, are very monotone and you don't want somebody like that to be presenting for a long period of time. You may have a presenter who's for lack of a better word, long-winded, who, who keeps talking and you, where your program may go over. So you have to make sure you have the, the right presenter for, uh, for these uh, events that you have. And then the audience, you, you know, think who your audience is, you know, is that a big age range? Are you, are you talking to students only? Is it just the regular adults or is it senior citizens or is it a, a, a mix? And you got to make sure you have the, the right um, content for your audiences when you're doing these uh, programs. And with data, and um, so with the virtual, you, know, you may be doing virtual registration or payments online, or you're, you're trying to get the demographics. How do you get that information if you have to do this online? But, you know, it's not like you're at a registration table filling out this stuff. Um, so how do you uh, manage that? So you have to think of that. Um, connectivity, I'm sure everyone on this call has, uh, since more have been on uh, these meetings and where there's always issues with connectivity, some of it gets uh, uh, found, um, there's trouble with the internet access or the dial-in numbers, so you wanna make sure it's easy and accessible for everybody. And then with accessibility, um, so, there could be people in your audience who maybe are blind or deaf or hard of hearing and or have, uh, you know, mobility issues or, you know, you want to make sure that everybody has access to the event and not feeling left out. So I mentioned with, um, with this, so we built a virtual event for our work readiness program in the summer. So, we had to adapt again from 80 hours. We cut it back to 40 hours, but we made sure we had the main content, what students, we wanted them to learn in our classroom setting. Um, we found out the first few days that some of the students had more of a intellectual disabilities than others, like more of a challenge. So we had to change on the fly our curriculum. Um, to make sure that everybody was getting and benefiting from the classroom. So we adapted once we figured out where we are, made some changes, and we made them quickly, and, uh, and, it, and it worked out perfectly. Um, and then, um, yeah, so we wanted everybody to understand that material. So it was uh, definitely a challenge. We did this all within a month of changing the curriculum and the, and the uh, getting the right platform. You know, when we started out, we had a different platform and realized it was not the best use for our teachers and the students because we wanted all the students to, to be on camera so we can have that connection with them. Um, so we changed that content uh, to make sure that everybody could be seen on screen, which is very important. And the other thing, you know, in the classroom setting, um, you know, you can, talk to them after class or before class to students and if anybody is struggling, you'll have a better sense. And you couldn't really do that in a virtual environment. So we decided to um, do one-on-one -on -one sessions with each student once a week. And this turned out to be very beneficial because we had 16 students in this class and we broke it down into two classes. We had eight in each one. Um, but just teacher would have struggled to, to get connected with all the students. So we decided to have a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, one hour session with each student each week. And that made that connection so much better. The, the, the student was able to talk to the, uh, 
the presenter or the teacher and answer any questions or if they're struggling, they could, they could help them. So this was uh, uh, very, very helpful. So there is qualities of accessibility. So that is you're able to be reached or entered, able to be obtained or used, or able to be understood and appreciated. So what does that mean? So reach or entered. So typically before the virtual environment, you, you would go somewhere, a physical environment. So that could be access to ramps or elevators in a building. But in the digital and virtual, this means that a person has access to the platform, you know, that they're able to get on or, or be able to register for the event. You know, for example, if you have an event and you have a registration page, and it's not compatible to screen readers, they may not be able to get into that presentation if they don't have anybody to assist them. So you wanna make sure, think about that or any type of documents, uh, permission slips or anything like that, you wanna make sure that everything is accessible so they will be able to participate in, in the program. Um, we mentioned able to be obtained or used. And uh, the same thing with the physical environment before uh, all this happened is you, know, you think of a, a kiosk that people would have to go like a medical place and you have the kiosk. But what if it's too tall and somebody's in a wheelchair and they're not able to, to reach that? Or you have a big event where there's a hundred people there, but there's people who are hard of hearing or, or deaf uh, and there's no interpreter. So you think about that. And, uh, um, but that, could also be used for in the virtual things. And uh, you wanna make sure that um, the document is being presented to be able to be used, viewed, viewed and heard by everyone. And then able to be understood or appreciated. So um, provided a way that everyone understands, as I mentioned for our summer work readiness program, um, we had to adapt to make sure that all students was able to understand the content that we were delivering. Um, and you know, like I said, we, you, I always say adaptability, always make changes on the fly, because um, everybody's learning. This is all a new process where everybody's learning. So accessibility considerations for people with disabilities attending virtual events. So, all different types of uh, disabilities, correct? So there's vision. You have mobility, auditory, and intellectual. So vision. So if you're only doing vision-only cues, um, if you put a, something on a, a picture on there and you're not explaining what it is, somebody with a visual impairment is not going to be able to see or understand what that is. You know, we can, you can have a game um, to make something interactive, okay, raise your hand on the virtual thing if you, whoever sees the rabbit first. If you have a visual impairment, you're not going to be able to see that rabbit, so they're not included. So you want to make sure everybody is able to have access to see this. Um, the same thing with auditory. Uh, if, uh, if there's audio-only cues, there could be a challenge. So, um, so you want to make sure that... Um, Everybody uh, announce who you are, um, and uh, I know we had trouble one time with a, a father and son. There's a five people in the in a conference call, and I, and I knew three of them, me included. And there's only two people I didn't know. They were a father and a son, but they had the same tone, same voice, pretty much. And it was hard to distinguish who they were because they didn't announce, "Hey, this is Sam" or "This is Bob." Um, so you just want to make sure everybody is uh, aware of that. And again, with intellectual, you make sure that the content is consistent, um, simplify it. Um, there, there's multiple ways to learn, um, the ability to revisit content as well. So inclusion during the virtual event life cycle. So there's the marketing, there's the registration, there's the planning, the, the event itself and then you have the post event. So event marketing, that is uh, accessibility of communication, um, inclusive language, uh, make sure uh, accommodations availability. 
with registration, make sure the registration is all accessible. Make sure you provide instructions for requesting accommodation. Um, send a guide on how to participate to registrants in advance. Um, and make sure that privacy is maintained. And when you're doing event planning, um, make sure um, all of our events or, or forms are accessible. You know, uh, we are promoting now a lot of our events. We have this work readiness program. We have a student leadership program. We have a certifications program and a disability, uh, uh, disability access at work program. And we're trying to promote these events. We're speaking and sending out flyers. And the one thing that we wanted to make sure before we send out these flyers that they are accessible for everyone. Uh, so when we do send them out, so it takes a little bit of extra time and effort, um, but it's something that is needed so everyone has access to them. Um, and regarding man managing events, um, again, make sure there's instructions for the, for the captioning, um, content flow management, make sure it's going smoothly. When there's multiple speakers, make sure you identify who the speakers are when they're talking. Um, if you're doing something visually, if it's on a PowerPoint, make sure that you describe what is on that PowerPoint for people who cannot see. And again, maintaining that privacy. And then post event. So a lot of times after an event, you want to send out a survey. Um, you want to make sure that is accessible. Um, invitation to offer suggestions. Sometimes you may not think of something and then somebody in the audience says, hey, maybe you should do this next time. Uh, so get that information because everybody, again, we're all learning together and, and, you're, and you don't think of everything, so, but you can always improve for your next one. And again, you want to maintain privacy while you're doing all this. All right, so we're going to move on to the, um, the second section, and that is the virtual tools and features. And so we're going to talk about tactical and accessible customer engagement. So we'll start off with audio communication. So there is automatic captioning, real-time captioning, remote interpreters, and also you want to make sure you address the corrections as, as it's happening. So automatic captioning. So this is already in the platform for a, a lot of like Zoom or, or Teams or whatever you're using. A lot of it's already in there. Um, and this is a feature that can be uh, turned on, it can be turned off, um, but it frequently makes mistakes, particularly with products, companies, uh, people and places, you know, non-important things. So, so you want to make sure that you have somebody in the chat room, and if there are mistakes, make sure that they address that and, and, and fix those mistakes in there. It's very similar to auto captioning of a video. Um, so real-time captioning, and what that is is a, a trained caption professional, like we have here today, um, who can provide so ahead of time, you can provide them the names, um, the agenda, special industry terms like the lingo, uh, send that to them in advance so they understand that they have that correct for when you do your presentation. And then you have remote interpreters, and that's somebody in sign language. They can engage in a video, a uh, very similar experience to having an interpreter at a live event. Um, you can also have had a time, provide those names, agenda, industry terms in advance. And, and some uh, the interpreters may be trained in specific industries, so you might get the right person for that event as well. And again, you want to make sure that um, you have a plan on how you would handle it when a mistake is made, because mistakes are going to happen, and, and make sure the audience knows that, put in the chat or what it is, um, so, you, they, so you can share that. Um, Make sure you have the right um, tool, you know, when you're trying to accommodate somebody. Um, if you have a sign language interpreter for somebody, but they don't speak sign language or they don't use sign language, then it's not going to be an effective tool. And if a person has a difficulty with their speech, you can have allow them to use the respond to questions um, in the chat features as well, which I think will be very, very important. And then with 
visual accommodations. You know, obviously, if it's something visual you have on a PowerPoint, a, a picture of a book or whatever, you want to explain what it is in detail so everybody would understand. You want to provide the display content prior if you can, um, put information in the chat, and there's a test mobile app option as well. So for many platforms, the mobile app, if, the, if people use that, they're not going to have as many features as, as the desktop, but, uh, but they will be more accessible for people um, especially who are screen readers. Um, sometimes you'll see um, presentations where the presenter is uh, writing in real time on a, a whiteboard uh, or other type of uh, things that you can write on there in, in real time. So if you're doing that, that's very visual, correct? But, but if there's somebody in the audience who has a visual impairment, you need to um, explain what you're putting on that right board and, and tell them in detail what it is so they are um, in the same page with everybody else um, and make sure that they understand. Um, the same thing, you, know, you could do uh, some sort of quiz or um, test or whatever in PowerPoint, but if they have a visual impairment, if it's just a visual thing, um, how, they're not going to be able to see it. So you want to make sure that you say what the questions are as, as well. One of my favorite things is to use in these uh, platforms is the chat feature. And um, so you can put event directions in your chat. Um, the captioning or interpreter, their access instructions could be in, in this chat feature. Um, any corrections that happen real time, you could put them in the chat feature. Um, I'm sure Gerald is putting all my mistakes in the chat feature as we speak. Um, you know, you can put links, uh, post links or email uh, into the chat feature, uh, highlight any key information that you want to emphasize, add that into the chat feature. And like I said, it's a great communication tool for those who cannot speak. Um, um, like I said, always put the event directions in the beginning. Um, like go on mute, make sure that people are aware of that when not speaking uh, during the presentation. Um, you make sure that they uh, post how to access captioning and interpreters, um, how to pin somebody we'll talk about, how to contact somebody after the event. You want to put that in the chat. Um, when you do this, is you know, because hopefully everybody's going to be on mute while you're talking, it can be less interruption. Uh, you're going to be in more control. Um, and you have a person who's in, in charge of the chat and reviewing the chat if anything important comes up or needs to be addressed, they can, they can break in. Um, you know, if you're talking like you have a virtual book club or whatever it may be, if it, uh, you have a visual book um, or you're talking about a book, you know, if you show it on the PowerPoint, you're not going to see it. If you have a visual impairment, so make sure you tell what, this is what the book, this is the, the cover, this is what we're talking about. So just make sure you explain what's on there visually um, as well. And pinning the main event speaker. That is not me, uh, for those who, that is not my avatar, but that's uh, maybe that was me like 10 years ago when I had hair. Um, so when you're having a main speaker, you want to pin them. That makes the, the, the speaker visually or bigger. Uh, so it prevents focus chains. It helps allows for lip reading, provides instructions, and announce event focus change. So what does that mean? Um, so if you're not pinned, it could you could um, be distracted. Um, you want to focus on the presenter or the speaker. So every morning at 8:30 a.m. and 9 a.m., I have uh, meetings with our staff and our team, and one of our my coworkers, uh, Gerald Homey. Uh, who's uh, on here at this call today, um, during COVID, he got a, uh, a cat. So the cat is, and Gerald is always on video, and the cat always comes in right during the meetings, and he'll jump right on top of Gerald or on his shoulders. He'll try to chew on the, uh, the um, headset or the wires or whatever, the, the chase of the, the little mouse thing. Um, and it's awesome, and we love to have the cat, but it also could be distracting. So if you or presenting, uh, you want to make sure there's no distractions like that, and you want to uh, um, make sure this on the picture, just focus on the presenter, and if you have everybody else, um, much smaller, less distraction. 
and then event recording. So we are uh, recording this event today. And so many virtual events can be overwhelming. Uh, recording events can allow participants to revisit important content multiple times or pause on key points. Uh, this is a very great option for busy professionals and those with learning disabilities. And I'm sure everyone on this call is going to go back and revisit this recording multiple times because it's a great presenter that you have today. <laughs> um, the other great feature that we have is on a lot of these platforms is raising your hand. So it provides a non-verbal uh, way to indicate a question or comment. It allows event moderator presenter to create a queue or a line for interaction. It allows for a quick crowd assessment or response to a yes, no question. And if the feature is not available, you can use the chat as, a, as an alternative. And again, it gives you more control, um, less interruptions. Um, so I think that is a helpful one. I think in noticing from March until now with all the different uh, seminars, webinars, and meetings that I go on to, people are getting to understand this more and more of the raise your hand feature and the chat feature uh, as we progress through this. And, uh, and I think more people are using it and I think it's been uh, very beneficial for that. And the third section that I wanna to talk to you about today is the virtual event management. And these are tips for group and one-on-one -on -one engagement. So, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when you're doing these webinars or events, um, it could be where there's a small amount of people, it could be a large amount of people, or it could be just one-on-one -on -one event. So if it's a multiple event, um, you want to make sure that when you change speakers, you announce who the new speaker is. You want to explain and follow protocols for engagement or interaction at the beginning. And you want to ensure someone is able to respond to questions and technical issues from the audience. I think that's also a key to have more than one person. You have the presenter, but you also have maybe have a moderator and somebody handling all the, the technical issues and the, and the chat. Um, so it's a good team effort for when you're doing this. Um, and same thing for one-on-one. -on -one. You want to always explain in, in the beginning the follow protocols for engagement, interaction, uh, you want to ensure conversation is not one-sided, and you want to ask questions to spark conversation. Sometimes it, it, you don't want it to be one-sided at all. Um, so when you were talking about an, uh, announcing to changing speakers, that will also help uh, whoever's doing the technical thing to pin the next speaker so they are the focus. It also will help the interpreters and the captioning when you announce that you are changing speakers. Um, you know, when we started this work readiness uh, program for our high school students uh, during the summer, you know, we found at the beginning that the teacher needed to be to remind students multiple times of how to engage in conversation, to make sure to avoid interruptions, to be on mute when they're not talking. And and I talk about high school students with disabilities, but this is, I've been in meetings where people always forget to, to mute or they, they interrupt and uh, or forget they're on camera or talking. Um, so you want to make sure that you know up front or to mute people um, so it makes it easier uh, for you. And then video best practices. So again, with multiple um, the you know, event, you make sure the event speakers should be on video when the bandwidth allows, and hopefully that's the case. And for interactive events, you want all participants, they should be invited to join via video. It makes it more personal. Um, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, that's the way to most mimic uh, an in-person interaction. That's the closest that you're going to get for one-on-one -on -one interaction if it's on video. Um, a video enhances the one-on-one -on -one conversations um, by allowing the participant to visually interact with the host. And with auto captioning, um, if it's a large group, you know, you can be, uh, can be used for participants who might have trouble hearing the speakers 
or whose primary language may not be. Um, again, it's not reliable as real-time captioning, and someone should, again, be assigned to post corrections in the chat for auto-captioning if it's being used. And if you're doing auto-captioning for one-on-one, -on -one, it could be used to provide support for participants who might have trouble hearing the speakers. It could be used to support quiet or silent communications when necessary. And you'll be, be attentive to errors to ensure that the message is communicated um, early. And then with privacy concerns. So with multiple people, you want to ensure participants understand that everyone can, can view what is being shared via chat and hear what is being said. One-on-one, um, -on -one, understand the participant's environment. Uh, do not require a person with a disability to provide a family member as an interpreter. So if you're a person who has a, a hearing loss or who's deaf and they go to a doctor's office and they don't provide an interpreter, and sometimes you may have to bring your family member in to interpret it, or if it's a debt consolidation, you have that meeting and you have to have maybe uncomfortable conversations. It may be something that that, that person may be embarrassed to talk about in front of the family or interpreter. So you just want to make sure that they have um, um, somebody who may be independent who can be the interpreter um, for the uh, for this for privacy. And you know, I talked about disability mentoring day. We are. Um, Usually, uh, part of the, the program that we do for high school students when they go to the business is one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring. They get to learn a little bit about what an accounting person does or an engineer. Um, but since we're doing this virtually this year, um, you know, um, we were a little hesitant of doing one-on-one -on -one with uh, uh, a student and somebody from the business doing one-on-one. -on -one. So it could be more of a, a group presentation uh, when we're doing this and instead of the one-on-one -on -one, and we're also making sure that we have uh, since a lot of people are going to be under 18 years old make sure that we have parental permission slips a virtual permit permission slip um, some of our businesses may have their own permission slip that they have to use that we have to get or the students uh, parents to sign and some of the schools may have their own thing that we have to sign off on or make sure that the businesses are aware so, um, so definitely privacy is an important thing when you're doing something online and especially for, uh, for people who are under 18 years old. So you, know, you have to keep that under consideration uh, as well. So before I, I turn it over to, um, to Mary, I wanted to talk about the top five big wins um, in virtual accessibility. Um, so. Thank you again for everybody who's listening. Um, so five big wins. So event accommodations. So directions for how to request an accommodation. Then when registering and, um, and when a interpreter is post in chat at the beginning of the event and call attention that, it, that it's being there. Captioning. Um, ensure that the correct level of captioning is available uh, to it being there. And organizing content always allows for better understanding of materials and information being shared when it's in logical order and equal participation. Everyone has the opportunity to feel like they are fully part of a virtual event, able to participate at the same level as everyone else. And event recording, for bigger events, it is easy to miss something or you may want to go back to certain points. Uh, th this allows for that to happen. So again, thank you so much, and I'm going to send it back to Mary. Thanks so much, Scott. That was amazing. I really am grateful for the thorough presentation that you've shared uh, relative to uh, virtual meetings and accessibility. So a couple of questions were asked that uh, I would like to review. Uh, one of them was about platform accessibility. First of all, thanks for the question. And as Gerald mentioned in the chat, uh, one group, one product area within Bender is our digital accessibility 
sustainability product area high test. So we have a wonderful opportunity internally to be able to have our team review uh, all of our documents, all of our technology systems. Uh, we also have a connection in with the uh, chief accessibility officer and her team of Microsoft. So we're constantly providing feedback. As you all know, Team Zoom, many of the other platforms, because of this new normal, uh, because everything changed uh, 28 weeks ago, uh, they're pushing out uh, advancements, innovations on these platforms. So sometimes the, the accessibility will recede in an area, but because they're pushing out uh, uh, innovations um, daily, it, it's uh, something that they address on a regular basis. Uh, Gerald, uh, if folks ask about uh, the event today being recorded, yes, it will be recorded. Uh, it will be captioned and available on the uh, FISA website. Um, one of the other questions that folks talked about was this concept of pinning, uh, pinning folks who are in the uh, web event. We all know that it's important to pin Scott, the presenter, uh, so that you have an opportunity to see the visual as he's communicating. Um, and, and, you know, best practice is to call out the name of the presenter as you kick off the web event so individuals know how to pin that person. Uh, there also, the, the second part of that question is, so if I have Scott pinned, uh, what do I do with the interpreter? So on these platforms, you have the ability to pin um, multiple people. Um, uh, we we uh, talked about, uh, uh, well, first of all, Gerald, do we have any more uh, questions from the chat? We just got one more question from Julia. Any recommendation for guiding participants taking over others online or mop monopolizing mm -hmm. the conversation? Yeah. Yes, I see that one in the chat, Gerald, and it's actually referring to participants talking over others online or monopolizing the conversation. Uh, really good point. Um, it really is no different than we when we have in person meetings. Uh, of course, there are within person meetings or family gatherings, uh, uh, one or two or 10 folks uh, that like to uh, talk. So sometimes we have talking over in in person meetings. Now online, you don't sometimes have the chance to, um, to, to notice that someone else has not concluded talking, uh, especially if you're not on video. Um, with as Scott mentioned, raising uh, your hand. So that is one way to queue up folks who are going to uh, be talking next. Another way is I uh, attend a lot of uh, web events for uh, multiple, uh, uh, you know, with multiple customers, uh, with uh, multiple volunteer efforts that I engage in, and where it works best, especially with a lot of participating parties, is not to just say at the beginning, hey, who's on the web event, but in fact, to um, to, to uh, take role, do a roll call with folks who are attending. So um, I'm hoping that that's helpful for you. Um, and Christy asked, what accommodations do you, you recommend offering asking about in registration? So Scott, I'm going to let you uh, provide an answer to that one and chime in if there is anything else I'd like to add. So Scott, there is no doubt about it. It's not a web event until we say, Scott, you're on mute. I, I did that on purpose because I was part of the presentation. So thank you, Mary. I did that. Oh, that's right. That's <laughs> of right. course, I did I not make a mistake on that. Yeah. That was intentional. <laughs> yes. So yeah, accommodations. Um, you know, during the registration. So you know, if it's elect, you know, more likely it's going to be electronic registration. So if it is. Uh, um, something that you're doing online, you want to make sure it is, is, is accessible. And um, you know, we have a great team at uh, Benefit that you know when we any document, any form that we have, 
we run it by them and they do a, a, a simple test to see if it's accessible, like fill in the, the uh, fillable uh, um, boxes or, um, Joe, you probably have a better explanation of what some of the types of things that we use for the, uh, for registration forms or, or documents. Yeah, so if you have a, a website that uh, you're using for registrations, you would just want to test that for accessibility to make sure that everybody can register for the event effectively. Um, in addition to that, if there's any, you know, th as far as what can you make available during the that request option, maybe you have a box that says, do you need any accommodations for this event? Um, you can, you know, for example, uh, sign language interpreting is something that would make sense to include in that um, physical copies of, or um, not physical copies, but um, copies of presentation materials so that they could be reviewed outside of the, uh, the time of the presentation, post-event, things of that nature. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Gerald and Scott, for covering that one. We have a question from Julia Kemner, not to be confused with Julia Shepard. Uh, what services do you recommend for an organization looking to be more inclusive for disabilities in the virtual schema to utilize, for, uh, for example, closed captioning services, making the event registration text to talk. So uh, it, to redress the two examples you shared, as it relates to captioning, uh, we have Heather from Caption First doing real-time captioning for this event. Uh, what's suitable, as Scott uh, referenced earlier on, is using the, um, the voice-to-text option. So it's, it's real-time captioning using one of these platforms such as Teams or Zoom. Uh, be careful about that because sometimes uh, mistakes may be made uh, and that's where you have an opportunity to correct those mistakes in the chat for someone who is engaging. Uh, making the event registration text to talk as it relates to uh, your website which is typically how you're going to ask people to register for an event. Um, you have the ability to apply a toolbar on your website that frequently is designated by uh, the accessibility guy. It's a blue circle with a stick figure in it. And that applied to your website, we happen to um, work with a company out of Tucson, Arizona, that uh, is publicly traded on the NASDAQ. And they have a free tool that you can download at audioi.com and apply it to your website. So then when people come to your website, they can uh, in increase the size of text. They can, uh, for those who um, you know, have, have low vision disability, they can uh, have a screen reader so if I'm blind, I probably have my own that's really feature rich, uh, JAWS software, non-visual desktop access, NVDA is, a, uh, is an open source product. Uh, JAWS requires a license. But this AudioWide product, again, you apply it to your website, it's very easy, they tell you what to do, and it allows uh, those who visit your site to be able to access um, you know, things like screen readers and, and uh, in, enhancing the size and they even have a font, so you can change the font, uh, and one of the fonts they use is a font specifically for people living with dyslexia. So it's really transformed uh, many users to that, uh, that site. So any other questions, Julia? Um, oh. Uh, I'm sorry, thanks, uh, Drew. It's actually called Audio I. So, audioeye.com. Oh, thanks, Sherry, for, uh, for mentioning that as well. So, what other questions do we have? Did I miss Sherry, Gerald? 
I think we've covered them all. I wanted to talk about one. I did an event like this uh, just a couple of weeks ago for the State Department for the embassy in Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina, and it was attended by uh, embassies uh, across Latin America and their partners. So you may know uh, within the State Department footprint in uh, countries and cities and countries across the world that there is uh, a place called American, America Spaces. And this is the place where folks come that, from that country to learn English, to learn about the American culture, to access opportunities prior to COVID-19, to, to travel here. And of course, when everything changed 28 weeks ago, they had conducted all of these courses in, engaging people uh, in in, in um, the actual America Spaces physical location. So now they have to engage folks virtually. So one of the questions that, uh, that the, the individuals asked is, what about privacy? And I just wanted to quickly share an example because of course uh, we've got the new normal going on. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I live with depression, I access therapy services. And one day I received, now I'm doing virtual visits, a uh, document from my therapist. So we all know that accessibility has always been important, but now it's urgent. Why? Because that can be a, a problem, a privacy violation. And I know many of you uh, would have people complete you know, forms or, or something when they are in person with you. So now when you're emailing them and they're not accessible, meaning you cannot fill that form out online, uh, it, it can be a privacy person. You could have somebody who is in, uh, is in a household with someone who is abusive. So if you have a form that needs to be filled out that's not accessible to fill out on a computer or a mobile device, then that individual has to print the form and that individual has to complete the form and then they have to scan in or take a photo of the form and then they have to remember to shred it so that, you know, if they would uh, be in that environment, uh, uh, you know, they, they would not, uh, they want to keep obviously this information private. So because of the new norm and how we're doing virtual visits, again, it's not just um, uh, important, but it's now urgent. So um, I'm now going to pass it back to Christy, unless folks have any additional questions. No questions. So uh, Christy Troutman, let's pass it back to you. Thanks so much for attending and participating today. We appreciate all the engagement in the chat. I wanna say thank you to Scott for your fabulous presentation and to Mary for um, doing a great job as our moderator um, of the whole session. Also, much appreciation to Gerald and Sherry for all of your behind the scenes help and assistance and uh, putting resources into the chat as we went, as well as troubleshooting. Um, this program will be recorded and the recording will be posted um, in the next week or two on disabilityinclusionpgh.org. While you are there, you can also check out other resources there um, are pre-recordings on Disability 101, on how to make sure your website is accessible, on document accessibility, on social media accessibility, and on the accessibility of um, in-person events. And so hope this is helpful and um, encourage you to join us again on October 6th for Avoiding Virtual Fatigue, Collaborate and Connect Online. Thank you. Love it. So thanks so much, Christy. And I just would like to leave all of you with one message. Please act. It, we all know that there's so much to be done as it relates to accessibility. Even if we take small actions in the margins, it pays big dividends for all of us and for the folks with whom we spend time. And finally, as, as President John F. Kennedy said, change is the law of life. And those who look 
only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. So I know all of you are very adaptable to change and you're preparing for the future, um, but that's definitely a powerful statement about what's relevant today. So we are now at the point where we are concluding the web event and I'll look forward to spending time with you on Tuesday, October 6th at 11 a.m. for Avoid Virtual Fatigue, Collaborate and Connect. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.